Hey, good afternoon, and thank you. Welcome to our next Lunch and Learn lecture series lecture. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about immunolabeling. And I'm kind of surprised that we haven't done one of these before, uh, because this is actually one of the backbones of fluorescence microscopy and something that we're all, all always doing all the time. Uh, so I think it's really important to go through this. Uh, I'm not going to spend time going through the specifics of the protocol, but if you're primary on, wash it off, if you're secondary on, wash it off. Uh, what I actually want to do is sort of give some more ideas about it, some more general concepts, things that you might not know about that might help you with your immunolabeling, or some other new technologies to, to watch it for, and some of the more basic concepts behind how it works. So here's a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. First of all, we're going to talk what is an antibody and the methods of antibody production. Just so that everybody's on the same page and knows the difference between a monoclonal antibody and a polyclonal antibody and the implications that both of those may have um, on your actual experiments. I'm also going to spend a fair bit of time talking about antibody validation. This is something that no one really thought about in the past, but has now come to light as being very important. Uh, and then we're going to talk about diffusion, because essentially immunolabeling all comes down to diffusion. Those antibodies have to diffuse into your sample and find their epitope of interest. So we're going to talk about what the barriers to that are and some ways to get around it. And some of the ways to get around that are some new antibodies or new types of labeling mechanisms that are out there, specifically nanobodies and anthemers. Uh, I'm also going to talk about which fluorophores are the best to link up to your secondary antibodies. And then we'll finally talk real quick about um, how to store your samples for, for the long term. Okay, so on this slide here, we have the basic structure of an antibody. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this from immunology classes in the past. Essentially, it's made up of uh, two heavy chains and two light chains. Uh, these heavy chains and light chains are held together by disulfide bridges. And at the end of each light chain and each heavy chain, uh, so this little area here and this little area here, there is the antigen binding site, and it's also referred to as the variable region. And this is the sequence of the antibody protein that changes and varies from antibody to antibody to recognize different epitopes. All right. So that's our basic structure. And I'm just really going to quickly point out some of the um, things that we can do to these antibodies. And we're going to come back to this a little bit later. But basically, there are two cleavage sites for two enzymes in here. So there's a pepsin cleavage site right here in the heavy chains. And there's also um, a papain cleavage site just before um, you get to the disulfide bridge that links the heavy chain and the light chain. And what this allows us to do is uh, cut these antibodies up into smaller subunits. So you can see here we have what we call a FAB2 fragment, an FAB2 fragment. Or um, after the papain cleavage, then we also get what we refer to as FAB fragments, FAB fragments. Okay. And like I said, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, and so as I mentioned on the overview slide, these antibodies can uh, be produced in two different ways. So they can be produced as polyclonal antibodies or monoclonal antibodies. And this production method really has uh, a huge impact and a huge effect on what you can expect when you start to do your immunofluorescence. So how do we make a polyclonal antibody? So Poly obviously stands for many, so what we're making is many different antibodies that are all going to hopefully target the same target. Um, for the most part, I'm just going to talk about the protein. So we're making a whole bunch of antibodies that hopefully target the same protein. So we start by taking our protein of interest, our antigen, so usually a small fragment of that, and injecting it into some sort of animal. Uh, this causes an immune response. A few days or weeks later, we're going to bleed that animal, uh, spin down the blood to remove all the uh, cellular debris, and just extract the serum with the antibodies in it. We're going to mix the serum 
with some sephiros beads that have the mobilized antigen bound to their surface. So this is the same antigen that we injected into the animal. We have that bound onto a sephiros bead. So that bead with the immobilized antigen gets mixed with all of the antibodies that are in this serum, but only the antibodies that recognize that antigen are going to bind to that bead. And then once again, we can spin this down and we can separate the beads from the rest of the serum and all the antibodies that don't recognize the antigen. And then we can finally purify those antibodies off the bead. And so what we have now is a collection of antibodies but all recognize the same target, the same antigen, but each one of those antibodies is a little bit different. So they're gonna be recognizing different regions of that antigen, okay? So now, monoclonal antibodies, on the other hand, obviously mono, standing for single. Now we're gonna have a single antibody, a single type of antibody, to a single region of our epitope or protein of interest, okay? So the process here to make these is obviously a little bit different. So we start out the same way. We take our antigen and inject it into our animal. In this case, it's usually a mouse. And we await a, an immune response. After we get that immune response, we remove all the B cells from the spleen and we mix these with myeloma cells. When these cells, these two cell populations are mixed together, what will happen, um, to some degree, there will be fusion. So there'll be a fusion between the myeloma cell and the B cell. And what this fusion does is it immortalizes that cell. So that cell can now divide um, over and over again. It's not infinite, but uh, it can divide many more times than the original B cell would be able to, okay? So um, obviously in this mixture, we're still gonna have some myeloma cells and some spleen cells that didn't fuse. There's uh, a selection marker that we can put in the media that will um, select strictly for the fusions. And so now we have a number of hybridomas, um, these B cells with myeloma cells. What we have to do is, um, so this is the medium, let's use, it's called a hat medium. So this selects for uh, fused cells. And then what we're gonna do is um, titer these down into single cell colonies and grow them up in 96 well plates and test the antibodies that are being produced by all these different B cells. And what we're gonna do is find which uh, well is producing antibodies to our original antigen. So this can be done, with, for example, in the LISA assay. And then what we have is a cell line of myeloma cells that can be cultured for a long period of time and should always be spitting out the exact same antibody. So now we have a nice, pure collection of our antibody of interest to our specific protein that we can freeze down those cells, call them out at a later date, and make more antibody. But it's just a single antibody to a single epitope. That's why it's a monoclonal. So if we take a look at these, so here's pictorially our protein of interest, this blob of blue circles. And you can see in a polyclonal situation, we have a number of different antibodies that are recognizing different sites on this protein. Whereas in our monoclonal model, we just have a single antibody binding to a single epitope. So this table here, um, mentions a lot of the differences that are found between polyclonal and monoclonal antibodies. Polyclonal are by far more popular, and these are what you're gonna find more often in online catalogs from different suppliers. The number one reason for this is that they're cheaper, so they're inexpensive to develop, and they're quick to produce. It only takes about three months to make these. Um, also, you can do them in a number of different host species. So this is a primary driver between, behind why you see more polyclonal antibodies out there than monoclonal. But what I really want to focus in on in this chart, and what's really important for immunofluorescence, is that with polyclonal antibodies, there's an increased likelihood for background noise, and there's a huge variability from lot to lot. 
every time you do that antibody challenge or that antigen challenge into the animal, you make a different set of polyclonal antibodies. They're never the same, right? And also, because you're making a number of different antibodies, there's a bigger chance for there to be cross-reactivity there. In the monoclonal antibody, you only have one antibody that can maybe cross-react with other proteins in your sample. However, here we have many, many different proteins, or many, many different antibodies, each of which may have a cross-reaction profile. So there's a much larger increase to get background noise and non-specific staining when you're using a polyclonal. So conversely with monoclonal, you don't have to worry about that background noise and you get, or you're less likely to worry about that background noise and you're going to get identical plots. So now there's a few different ways that we can utilize monoclonal antibodies and polyclonal antibodies while we're doing our immunostaining. Most often with immunostaining, uh, you're doing a primary antibody that binds to your specific uh, protein of interest, and then you're coming in with a secondary antibody that's carrying your fluorescent signal. So because of that, there's different combinations of monoclonal, 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 polyclonal. Um, and the biggest impact that this has is creating amplification of your signal and also allowing um, more or less of a chance of there being um, non-specific cross-reactivity. So let's take a look at each one of these uh, possible combinations and see how this plays out. So here's our cell. And let's say we have a protein of interest right here, this green rectangle. And what we're going to do first is the most simplest method. So this is, I think, mean, this monoclonal direct. This is taking a monoclonal antibody. So it's a single antibody that's going to recognize a single epitope on our protein of interest. All right? So we have a one-to-one -one binding ratio here between our protein of interest and our antibody. And here we've directly labeled that monoclonal antibody with a fluorophore. So this situation, there's only a primary antibody, there's no secondary antibody. This has a disadvantage of not giving us any amplification. So we only have a single fluorophore for each protein. But this gives us the most specific signal. This is also the most quantitative analysis that you can do, as you have one fluorophore per protein of interest. Okay. So no amplification, but most specific signal and most quantitative. The next option we have is a monoclonal indirect. So we're going to start it the exact same way with a monoclonal primary antibody that's going to bind to our protein of interest. But this time, this is not labeled with a fluorophore. So here we need a secondary antibody that's carrying the fluorophore. Now, secondary antibodies, you'll notice when you buy them, they're all polyclonal. Uh, the reason for this is this provides you with amplification. So now we have. Uh, polyclonal secondary antibodies that recognize this primary antibody and they come with fluorophores attached onto them. So now you can see we're getting amplification in this diagram. Uh, we have now two fluorophores for every protein of interest. In reality, this, the amplification is a lot more than that. Right? So now we're getting some amplification, um, but a less specific signal. There's more opportunity for cross-reactivity here. You can have cross-reactivity from your primary, cross-reactivity from your secondary, and we're also introducing polyclonal antibodies, so that's going to give a little bit more uh, non-specific binding as well. Alright, finally, we can use a polyclonal indirect assay. So here, we're starting with a polyclonal primary antibody. So we have a polyclonal primary antibody that recognizes multiple epitopes on our protein of interest. And then we come in with a polyclonal secondary. Uh, so now we have secondary polyclonal antibodies, multiple secondary antibodies recognizing a single primary antibody. And these all have fluorophore. So here we now get the most amplification 
but we get the least specific signal. So this is um, what you need to do if you have a very low expressing protein. You need that amplification to be able to see it, but also accept the fact that you might now be introducing um, less specificity. Okay, and this can be a major problem um, depending on how good these polyclonal antibodies are. And some of that specificity specificity and ability to recognize your, program, um, your protein of interest has to do with how your sample was prepared and how the original antibody was produced. So it's very common practice to find antibodies um, that are often only tested for Western blots. So when you look at the product data sheet, it shows you this Western blot with this nice single band on it. Um, there's a big difference between what's happening with the protein on a Western block versus what's happening in your tissue when you're doing immunofluorescence. So on that Western block, that protein has been completely denatured. Um, you're moving it through that SDS, you've denatured it ahead of time. And so you have a nice long um, polyamino acid string, essentially, moving through your Western block. However, with our tissue, uh, depending on our fixation characteristics, that protein is still very closely mimicking its natural state. So if the antibody, say, recognizes this portion of the protein right here, that's no problem in the Western blot. But what if that portion of the protein is buried right in the inside of this natural protein? There's no way the antibody can access that. So, the other thing that is um, difficult in this situation is a lot of the time the antigens that are used to challenge the animals are just a denatured strain of polyamino acids. So resembling this is more, um, this situation here resembles more of what is actually injected into the animal. So it's very possible to get antibodies raised against internal parts of the protein that aren't accessible when doing immunofluorescence. So oftentimes you can see a description of the antigen that was used to produce a protein or to produce an antibody. Uh, and sometimes you'll find in there that instead of just using uh, polyamino acids, um, in some situations they'll actually use uh, enzymatically digested proteins. But this is definitely more common and something you have to watch out for. You can also sometimes see listed what region of the protein was used for making the antibody. And in general, if you get closer to the NRC terminus, uh, especially if you have this crystal structure available, you can actually see where that epitope is or, or where that part of the protein is that the antibody was developed towards uh, and get an idea of whether it's going to be on the surface or not of the nature. Something else that plays an important role is how you fix your protein. So when I was in grad school, I did a lot of work in trafficking. Uh, so I was looking at membrane proteins that are moving through early endosomes and late endosomes and eventually being degraded. So before that, I had these two great marker antibodies. There was one that was to a protein called EEA1, which marked early endosomes very well, and another to a protein called LAMP2, which was a great marker of lysosomes. Now, if I fix myself with a methanol fixation, so just put cold methanol on my cells, what this does is essentially just removes all the water from the cell and gives you a fixation process that way. The LAMP2 antibody worked absolutely perfectly. The EEA1 antibody was terrible. It did not recognize what it was supposed to. On the other hand, if I fix my cells with paraformaldehyde, which cross-links all these different proteins, or all these different amino acids together within your protein. In this situation, my EEA1 antibody worked perfectly, but the LAMP2 looked terrible. So for this series of experiments that I was doing, I had to do everything in duplicate, fix the cells both in methanol and in paraformaldehyde, do my LAMP2 studies with the cells fixed this way, and my EEA1 studies with the cells fixed 
Uh, and this is something that you'll commonly find. Uh, some antibodies actually prefer to recognize cross-linked proteins, cross-linked with paraformaldehyde, and some like to see proteins that have been dehydrated. And again, a lot of this comes back to how the antibody was actually produced in the first place. Okay? So this is just questions to ask yourself. How was the antigen produced? Was it with a short synthetic peptide or an enzymatic acute protein? And how has that antigen been preserved in your study? Um, was it preserved by removing water or by doing a paraphernalia? Okay, so those are some things that you can ask yourself ahead of time and you can hopefully dig through the data on the company's website when you're thinking about purchasing an antibody. But there's something that's really come to the forefront lately and that is antibody validation. And it's actually very worrisome to think about what has happened over the past um, for example, if I were to order a computer online and that computer showed up and I had to run a whole bunch of tests to make sure that it actually worked properly and actually was the computer that I was told I was sent, I would never buy that from that company. No one would ever buy that from that company. But for some reason as biologists, we've accepted that it's reasonable for the companies that make these antibodies to send us things that may or may not work. And we're gonna pay them our three or four hundred dollars, it may or may not work, and if it doesn't work, we might get a replacement of another tube that doesn't work either, and eventually we're gonna give up and go on to something else. And it's actually scary to think how much money in the research field has been wasted on antibodies that don't work, and how many things have been published that are just absolute junk because of the antibodies that we use. So I'm going to give you two examples from my past. So the first example, this is looking back at our cell that we've already seen already. So in grad school, I worked on a transmembrane protein as a receptor tyrosine kinase. And I've been working on, like I said, trafficking of this molecule for quite a while. And all of a sudden, I started seeing in some of my immunofluorescence studies that I would see these pump it inside the nucleus. And it looked like this receptor was moving to the nucleus. This was really interesting. Uh, no one had ever seen this before for our protein. I started digging through the literature and I found a few studies out there that suggest that this might be possible for other receptor targeting kinases. So I said, I jumped into this and said, okay, this is going to be a big part of my PhD project. I'm going to find out what this molecule is doing in the nucleus. And so I did a few initial experiments and things were starting to take off, wrote some proposals, even actually, I think it was in my uh, PhD fellowship, this was part of the proposal. The data all looked good. And then all of a sudden, I stopped seeing this. Um, so I was doing aminofluorescent studies, I was still seeing the signal outside of the nucleus, but I couldn't see the signal in the nucleus anymore. And I went through trying to figure out what was different, repeated the assay over and over and over and over. And finally, what I discovered was we'd actually run out of our primary antibody that we used in the lab to recognize this protein. And we ordered a new tube. It was a different lot number. It was a polyclonal antibody. And this signal was no longer there. So what actually, obviously, you can figure out what happened. This was just a nonspecific binding that was specific to that lot of antibody that we were using. And once we switched to another lot, it no longer existed. Um, this was incredibly annoying, and I wasted a lot of time doing it. And from that point on, we actually had to um, strike a bit of a deal with the company that whenever they came out with a new lot, they would send it to us, we would test it. If it looked okay, we'd then order a couple tubes of it so that we had it in store. Uh, if that lot wasn't doing what we wanted, we'd just send it back to them. So that was part A. Part B, um, this protein here, this transmembrane protein, it's called RET. If you run it out in the Western blot, you get two bands. Uh, this bottom band is an immature form that's still going through the ER and Golgi. And then this upper top band is a glycosylated form, the mature form of the protein that's expressed on the membrane. And again, what we found with 
Again, there's only polychromal antibodies. They were the only thing that we had to this protein. What we found was that sometimes they wouldn't be able to recognize this band at the top. So that glycosylation apparently, for some reason, was interfering with some of the rounds of polychromal antibodies that were being made. Um, and they couldn't actually pick up these upper bands. So again, we had to start adding a second step to our screening of these antibodies. Not only to make sure that they're localizing to the right part of the cell, but also that they could pick up both the immature and mature form of our protein of interest. Uh, especially because this mature band was the one that we were really the most interested in. So of course, I'm not the only person that's run into this. Um, there's this paper that came out in 2008. Um, and this, I think, was one of the initial publications that sort of got people talking about, hey, look, this is ridiculous. We need to do something here. So this group uh, ordered 10 commercial antibodies to this adrenergic receptor. And what they actually had was they had a line of knockout mice. Uh, so they had knockout mice that did not express um, these individual receptors, or they even had one that didn't express all three subtypes. And what they found was that with all 10 of these antibodies in the knockout mouse that didn't express this protein at all, all 10 of them still showed a band at the right size on a Western blot. All 10 of these commercially available antibodies, which had been in numerous publications up until this point, were recognizing something else. And the scary part is, is this really isn't all that uncommon. We just haven't detected it all that much. So a few years later, um, one of the primary citations of this review was that last paper that I just showed you. This group from Yale who are particularly interested in immunohistochemistry, so for example, bad staining on tissue sections, a lot of pathology type studies. Uh, published this review in Biotechniques. This paper now has over 200 citations. Um, the editor of Biotechniques has made it his personal mission to go around to conferences and educate everybody about this and demand better validation from industry. Um, so the Ring Group published this paper, and this was essentially their protocol for validating antibodies. So when they purchase an antibody, this is the protocol that they go through to validate that. So it's a five step protocol. I've added step number six down here. This is my edition. Uh, but essentially what they do is they, their first step is a Western blot analysis of a large panel of cell lines. So they have um, lysates from a whole bunch of different cell lines that they've accumulated over the different years. And the idea here that is, uh, is that at least in some of those cell lines, they should be negative for that protein. That protein shouldn't necessarily be produced in every single one of those cells. Obviously, this doesn't work with something like tubular interactin. Um, but the idea here is that you should see at least one or two cell lines that are negative. So that's their first uh, step. Their second is a Western blood analysis after an siRNA knockdown. And then this is followed by um, if they're looking at phosphoantibodies or antibodies that uh, recognize activated or inactivated forms of proteins. They'll use some activators or inhibitors that are known to augment those proteins and then check to see whether those fossil antibodies do pick up the activated form, not the inactivated form. Finally, they do an antibody titration in tissue. Um, so this is actually now looking in cells and they do this in uh, mainly in immunohistochemistry, chemistry, I think, in their studies, but also you can do this with immunofluorescence. And this is mainly to check that the localization is correct. So if it's a nuclear protein, is it in the nucleus? If the cytoplasmic protein is in the cytoplasm, is it on the membrane? Uh, where should it be? And then finally, what they do is they request multiple lots from the supplier and compare multiple lots to see how much variability there is uh, between the different lots. And finally, what I've added in here is number six, and I think this is. The, the best and key test to validate anybody, any antibody. If you have mouse knockouts that you can use, that's perfect. Um, also, we now all have access to CRISPR, and this is becoming, and gene, genome editing is 
popular, much more easier. Uh, this is really the ultimate test. So once you uh, removed that gene altogether, do you still see something, um, or does that remove your signal altogether? So these are really important validations that you can do and should be doing with your antibodies. So just to continue to beat the dead horse, uh, this was another commentary that came out in Nature last year. And this was two researchers, and it was also co-signed by 110 other scientists that suggested we need some sort of standardization for antibodies that are used in research. And the, I've oversimplified their commentary, but essentially there was two key messages. One was, let's end the use of polyclonal antibodies. And the second one was, let's sequence the monoclonals and start producing them more commonly. This is a very interesting proposal, and again, I just want to bring this up to show you and make you aware of the concerns that are out there in the community and what people are trying to do to address them. So just to wrap up the validation, um, a lot of suppliers are now starting to jump on board with this. Pretty much every antibody supplier you're going to go to is going to have something on their website about validation, saying we validate our antibodies. Uh, if it doesn't, go to another supplier. But just because it says that they're validating it, it doesn't mean that it's meaningful. So dig into it, take a look at the data, send them some questions, uh, make sure that they are doing meaningful validations, not just showing you a Western blot where they crop the top and the bottom and you just see the bands of interest. Uh, also, a lot of companies will now allow you to purchase test samples or small samples that you can take a look at that are much cheaper. Um, another thing that you can sometimes do is offer to test. If you have a knockout or you have um, something that you've done with, with CRISPR where you've done some genome editing and removed um, the gene, offer to test it for them. Uh, a lot of the times, if you see they're missing data on their website, they would like to have it there. And they're more than happy to give you some antibody in exchange for your data. And again, this helps the, the rest of the scientific see that anybody actually is validated. Okay, so back to the actual science. Um, so barriers to diffusion. So I said in the opening that immunofluorescence, immunostaining is essentially a diffusion process. So there are a number of barriers to diffusion. What we need is we need these antibodies to somehow be able to get into our cells or into our tissue and actually find their target of interest. So the first barrier to diffusion that's out there is the plasma membrane. Obviously an antibody can't get through uh, a standard plasma membrane. This is why if you're doing live cell imaging, you can't just pour some antibody in there to a nuclear epitope and get it labeled, okay? So the membrane presents a very strong barrier. So how are we gonna get through there? Um, this is done through permeabilization processes. This is primarily talking about fixed samples, um, although there are some examples of doing this to some degree with live samples, it's certainly not recommended. Um, so what we need to do is punch some holes in this membrane to be able to get these antibodies through. And this is a process known as permeabilization. There's three main uh, techniques or methods that are used to do this. The first one is Fixation. Uh, most people don't realize this, but just doing fixation alone punches some holes in the membrane and permeabilizes your cells to some degree. Especially if you're doing this with alcohols, um, these will quickly solvate the lipids and pull them away. But even with paraformaldehyde, paraformaldehyde to some degree will put some holes in that membrane. What's most commonly used is some low concentration of detergent, most commonly Trichnax. 100 or between 20. Um, at low concentrations, these are able to form some micelles and that lipid and pull them out of the way. Something else that's been used uh, and is generally thought to be a little more gentle than detergent, so it will preserve more of the membrane but still put some holes in it, are saponins. So these are chemicals that are harvested from plants that essentially just do this they punch holes in the membrane. 
So the first barrier to diffusion was the membrane. And the second barrier to diffusion that I'm going to talk about is my very scientific term, stuff. So this is a really neat image out of a paper out of the Lichtman lab from last year. And this shows uh, some brain tissue. And what's crazy here is trying to find some free space in this piece of tissue is nearly impossible. You just have cells on top of cells on top of cells all mixed in to one another. So trying to diffuse through this is going to be incredibly difficult. Now obviously this is on the tissue level, um, and antibody is working more on the molecular level, but inside the cell it's the same thing. There's not a lot of free space inside that cell. Things are packed in very, very tight. So how do we get through this stuff to diffusion barrier? The number one way is by time. So if you're doing amino labeling of monoclonal cell, or sorry, monoclonal layers of cells on a cover slip, you don't have to wait very long. You can usually get away with your primary antibody being on there for a couple hours, your secondary antibody being on there for a couple hours, sometimes even less. And you'll still get a nice, strong staining. Okay? Um, but what about when you're looking at tissue sections? So now you've got a big slab of tissue and you need that antibody to be able to penetrate through it. This is going to take time. And in this situation, you're looking at days. Um, you're going to want to leave that antibody on there for a few days, followed by a few days of washing, followed by your secondary antibody for a few more days, and then a couple more days of washing. Remember when you're doing that washing that it takes that antibody that didn't bind any epitope in the middle of your tissue just as long to diffuse back out as it did to get in there in the first place. So this idea of putting a primary antibody on for two hours swirling some PBS three times for about two seconds each time doesn't cut it. You need to give that antibody time to diffuse back out. But there are a few things that we can do to speed up this diffusion. Okay? So, um, primarily what we're going to do is try and go smaller. So, I showed you on the opening slide that there's some ways that we can cut up these protein or these antibodies with various different enzymes. So we can create these uh, FAB2 fragments or even FAB fragments. So your typical antibody comes in about 150 kilodaltons. One of these FAB fragments is 50 kilodaltons in size. So you can see we've done a dramatic reduction in the size of that antibody, and it is now able to diffuse through our sample much small or much quicker. We can go smaller still. So something you may have heard of more recently are single domain antibodies. Uh, these are also sometimes called nanobodies. And these are primarily produced in uh, camels and sharks. So for the most part, uh, in the commercial implementations right now, they're being produced in up pockets. So there's a couple things that you can do here. Essentially what they have is just this very short single domain variable region. Uh, so you can produce this antibody, cleave off these variable domains, and then you can actually sequence these and recombinantly make them. They're about 15 cold dolphins in size, so they're really, really tiny. You can directly label them with chloroform. They diffuse through tissue about five times faster than a standard antibody. You can easily make them in bacteria because they're so small, uh, so they're really fast to make. The one drawback is you're not getting amplification. So this is equivalent to our directly labeled monoclonal antibody label that I showed you in some of those earlier slides. Uh, so you're just going to have one of these variable regions and single core for a on So you're not going to get a lot of amplification. But you're going to get very, very fast. And finally, you can go even one step smaller than that. Um, and that is an aptamer. So an aptamer is just a short oligo, DNA oligo, that's able to recognize a specific molecule. Okay. So these are a lot harder to make. Uh, there's 
from what I understand and what I gather, there seems to be a lot of off-target effects with them. It's hard to get ones that are really specific. But when you do, they seem to outperform antibodies. So here's an example of some to the um, labeling transferrin. Um, so the transferrin receptor. So here's the aptamer. Uh, this is essentially the number of endosomes that were labeled using an aptamer to the transferrin receptor. Here's the number in the black bar that were labeled um, after using an antibody. And then the gold bar here is actually using a fluorescent label uh, transferrin ligand. So you can see these are roughly equivalent between the aptamer and the natural ligand, but the antibody is clearly missing a lot of these um, transferrin receptors. And again, these are absolutely tiny, so they diffuse through tissue very, very fast. So then we come to our ultimate challenge, clear tissue. And this was really the driving reason behind giving this lecture, is there are a lot of people now that are trying to do amino labeling on these really thick pieces of tissue because we're able to clear them. So this example here is a 5-1 GFP mouse brain that was cleared and imaged in the facility. So obviously this is with uh, a genetically modified mouse that's expressing GFP, so it's no problem to get that labeling all the way through the tissue. But what if you want to do this with an antibody? So I told you that our primary barriers to diffusion are the stuff and plasma membranes that are in there. So if you look at clear tissue, in my opinion, there's really only two of the clearing methods out there that have the potential to work for, for amino labeling of really thick tissue. Now by really thick tissue, I mean things that are over, say, 500 microns. Less than 500 microns, all the clearing techniques are fine. You can amino label just non-clear tissue probably through that distance. But if you really want to go deeper than that, if you want to start doing whole tissues, you need to get rid of as much of that liquid as possible to reduce the barriers uh, for those antibodies to move through your tissue. So step one is remove the lipid. I just go and clarity do a very good job of removing all of this lipid. Now your second step is waiting. So here you're going to be at least five days of primary antibody at least two days of washing, another five days of your secondary antibody, and another two days of washing. Uh, what we found in the facility is that two millimeters seems reasonable. A millimeter of penetration from each side seems to work well with most antibodies. But beyond that, things are very antibody dependent. And I think a lot of this comes back to that variability between antibodies that you need to validate that we talked about before. Um, there are a few tricks though. So if you're using the clarity method, um, what you can do is play around with your hydrogel pore size. So obviously the first step of clarity is to embed your sample in hydrogel, usually a chromide. And here you can see by varying the concentrations of this acrylamide and acrylamide that you use, you can make these pores larger and larger. So here we have a nice big pore size in that hydrogel, where it's going to be quite tiny. This is going to allow antibodies to diffuse through that tissue a little bit faster. The most common thing that we see with uh, amino labeling of big thick tissues is just this big ring around the outside. So you have this big ring of fluorescence around the outside of the tissue and in the middle it's just empty. And there's three main ways that these can arise. So one is too little incubation time. Another is too much antibody with a lot of non-specific staining. And the third is just poor non-specific antibody. Right. So case number three here, there's really no way around this. There's nothing that you can do about it. You gotta buy or find a better antibody. For number one and number two, how do we differentiate which one's the problem? Uh, number one, when you have too little incubation time, or this can also be too little antibody, what you'll see is this ring around the outside will be very specific staining. So you will see 
uh, your protein or your structure of interest, and it'll be more of a gradual um, dimming or decline in signal as you move towards the center of your sample. Okay. So that just means you need a little more incubation time or a little more antibody. When you have too much antibody, this ring around the outside is very nonspecific. It's just a big blob of stain. Um, it seems to be uh, maybe some interactions between individual antibodies that are then getting stuck in tissue. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. But this definitely appears as just a big blob of nonspecific staining. At that point, you want to reduce your antibody concentration and try it again. The other thing to be careful about, too, like a throw this experiment is if your tissue isn't very clear. So if your tissue isn't entirely clear, this middle is going to look dark as well. Um, so the one key thing you can do there is just take this tissue, cut it in half, take a really thin section from the middle, and then look at that on a standard microscope, just a live flow microscope, and see if you've got antibody penetration. The real take home message here though is optimize. You have to optimize, optimize, optimize. Uh, and it's going to take a lot of time and it's going to cost some money. So you have to really be committed to these experiments. All right. So, what are the best fluorophores to stick on your secondary antibodies? This is something that I'm often asked. Uh, usually, when new users come in and we do that initial 10, 15 minute sit down just to talk about your project, one of the things I always like to talk about is which guys are you using? which ones work best with microscopes in the facility. So in general, uh, these are the four that I recommend starting with. So usually most people want to do a nuclear stain, so uh, we're going to do a DAPI stain here. Uh, Hooks is also another option, but what you can see here is DAPI has this really broad emission spectrum. It's shown here as a blue dye, but it's really a blue, green, red dye. It's also a white dye. Um, this emission spectrum is even a little bit broader for hooks, which is why I like to recommend DAPI over hooks. Okay. And then as far as chlorophores go, um, I'm usually recommending uh, a 488, a 568, and a 647. So that gives us a green, an orange, and a far red. And these match perfectly to the laser lines that we have in the facility. Primarily on our newer scopes we're working with an argon laser at 488, um, a diode laser at 561, and a heating laser at 633. So these guys all work really well. Okay. Uh, as far as which company you get these from, uh, this does matter. Stick to the companies that design fluorophores for microscopy. There's a lot of companies out there that make fluorophores that were originally designed for RT-PCR or DNA fish, um, and these ones aren't as stable. So definitely stick to the ones that were made for microscopy, like Alexa's or Atto's. Um, those are good companies that are out there making those. Now, if you don't need DAPI, you don't need a nuclear stain, and you still want to do four color imaging, um, in the blue region, this brilliant violet 421 seems to be a good option. Alexa 405 as well. Just know the blue dyes are never very bright. So when you're figuring out which dye is gonna go with which protein, make sure the blue dyes are on your most abundant protein. Because both those BD421 and Alexa 405, neither one is very bright. <clears throat> now, if you wanna to go to five colors, this is the change that I usually recommend. So we're gonna stick with uh, uh, 405 or 421 in our blue or our DAPI. Uh, and then we're going to stick with 488. We're going to switch to a more yellow dye, 555, and a more red dye, 594, and then keep our 647 as well. So for a five color, that's what I recommend. If you want to go beyond five colors, you can talk to me. Okay. And another word of warning uh, when choosing your secondary antibodies, be very careful about which species they're raised in. This, this happens every once in a while. It happened to me when I was in grad school. I did this experiment. I was looking for co-localization. I had absolutely perfect co-localization. I said, this is incredible. 
the most the best experiment that's ever been done in the history of science. Uh, and what I realized later was there was actually a problem with the antibodies. So here we have two proteins of interest, our blue protein and our yellow protein, that we want to see if they co-localize. What we've done here is we've taken a primary antibody, so our anti-blue antibody, that was raised in a rabbit. Okay. And over here we have our anti-yellow antibody that was raised in goat. Now we have a secondary antibody here, which is an anti-rabbit antibody, so it's going to bind this primary, and it was raised in a goat. And over here we have a secondary antibody that uh, was raised in rabbit, and it is raised against the goat. So obviously this one binds nicely here. This one binds nicely here. But there's another problem here. And it's this antibody over here. It's an anti-goat antibody. In this system, we have two antibodies that were raised in goat. So not only is it going to recognize this one here, which it's supposed to, it's also going to bind over here. And now we have a situation where we have three antibodies changed together here, and we have perfect localization between these two. So you definitely need to watch out for the secondary antibody cross-reaction. So here are my tips to help you avoid this. Um, keep your secondary antibodies um, so that they're all raised in the same species. And make sure that none of your primaries were raised in that species. What I usually like to do is I like to primarily order anti-chicken secondary antibodies. Because what I find is virtually no primary antibodies out there are raised in chicken. But there is a pretty wide range of secondary antibodies anti-chicken. Or, so it shouldn't say anti-chicken, it should say chicken, anti-whatever. Um, but there's a really broad range of these, and it's great. You don't have to worry about any of this bizarre cross -reactive. So I just want to finish off just by talking about how to store your slides once you're done your experiments. And this is just methods for preservation. The key thing here is that you want to try and limit diffusion. So there's two main methods to do this. What happens is when your antibody binds your protein of interest in your sample, that binding isn't permanent. At some point, that antibody is going to fall off and diffuse out. Also, to some degree, the dye that's labeled to that antibody could also fall off and diffuse out as well. So here, your goal, unlike everything we've talked about up until this point where we've been trying to enhance diffusion, now what you need to do is limit diffusion. And there's two key ways to do this. One is a post-fixation. So after you have your primary and secondary antibody on there, you can give your sample a quick dip in paraformaldehyde again, and then that's going to fix those antibodies in place. So now they're linked much more tightly to your actual sample. And the other thing, because this is a thermodynamic process, obviously you can store these at four degrees, uh, and that's going to limit some diffusion there as well. Um, I just want to make sure that there's no confusion here with antifade agents. So antifade agents aren't necessarily designed to prevent fading of your dye over time. So that dye is still going to degrade over time as it's exposed to light here and there. Um, the best thing you can do to preserve that fluorescence over time is just by keeping the slides in the dark. Okay? Antifades are more for when you're actually imaging to prevent photo bleaching. Um, so they are very important, but they're important in a different realm. And that's the idea of actually during imaging, where it's really important to have that antifade to prevent, prevent photo bleaching and to have a really good refractive index match for your mounting media, your glass cover slip, and your immersion line. And that's just what's shown on the side here, is the effect of different immersion, or different mounting medias um, on your actual point spread. Cool, so that's all I have to say about amino fluorescence. Um, thanks for coming out, and we'll see you at our next launch of